Hi folks. So I recently became a first-time homeowner, and as usually happens with these things, I got the urge to personalize my house a little bit, you know, spruce it up. So, this is my bedroom, very basic. And I thought I could, you know, spruce it up a little bit, make it a bit more interesting. After all, I do spend a lot of time in here, most of that time is sleeping, of course, but, you know, I come home, I want to kind of relax and you know, take it easy and having a plain room like this just wasn't doing it for me. I want to be able to use this room for just, you know, reading or maybe even watching, you know, some relaxing movie or something like that. So I would like to have some uh, edge lighting. So, you know, like a whole row of lights all the way around. These beams are going to be attached up there and there's going to be a row of uh, LEDs all the way along here. Well, any self-respecting electronics geek loves blinking lights and uh, come on, yeah, I have a room full of LED lights. How could I not make each one individually addressable? So that's exactly what I'm going to do and I'm going to detail in my little video here how I did that. Um, but basically what I'm going to have is uh, a series of, uh, what was it, WS2801s, uh, uh, chips from uh, World Semi. These are chips that are very commonly used in things like uh, LED light strips, uh, RGB versions. So each chip can control uh, red, a red, a green, and a blue LED, and can control each color uh, independently, it can vary the brightness using uh, pulse width modulation. I've got one running here, it's running three white LEDs. So there's a chip there, just on a uh, you know surfboard or whatever you want to call it, with my Arduino driving it. And uh, these guys are perfect for this application because uh, they're really meant to be daisy chained so you can have as big of an array as you want. Uh, the only limitation is basically how far you can send the signal along a piece of wire. But even that's not too much of a problem because each chip buffers the stream of information. So you can get really, really big arrays. All right, so here's a quick breakout circuit that I made uh, for the WS2801. Uh, here's the layout up there. And uh, as you can see, it's very simple to use. Um, if you've ever used a shift register before, it is very similar. Uh, there's a couple of differences which I'll get into. But basically, here you have your power input and uh, clock in and serial data in. These two resistors are just for impedance matching, so 250 ohm uh, resistors to prevent any reflections back down the line. If you read the data sheet, it tells you uh, all about that. You've got these three resistors down here um, to control the current uh, through the LEDs. You've got your LED out, so this is constant current. You just hook one end of the LED to one of these pins and then the other pin goes directly to uh, your voltage input. No need for a resistor because these take care of that. And on the other side you've got clock out and serial data out. I said that the, uh, these chips are different from regular shift registers because uh, you'll notice here that this is a circuit schematic, uh, here's the URL, well you can't read that but I'll post it, of how you cascade regular shift registers. And uh, well you basically have to share a couple lines, you have to share your data, you know, coming out of one shift register into the other, you have to share your clock pulse, which is paralleled in, and you have to share your latch pin, which is shared. So basically every time that uh, the microcontroller wants to send out some bits, uh, you know, let's say it's uh, putting out 16 bits, uh, 8 bits for each um, shift register, it pulses the clock line 16 times and both chips get 16 clock pulses. When all 16 clock pulses are complete, then the microcontroller pulses the latch line which actually pushes the data that's in each, each shift register out into the output pins and into the LEDs. Now sharing the uh, clock and latch lines is all well and good, 
uh, if you just have a couple of chips. But uh, consider the use case for these Dell DS2801s. You can have, you know, 10, 15, 20, uh, even more chips all hooked up in a row. And sharing a single clock line, for instance, across all of them would require some pretty heavy duty uh, driver circuitry to just drive that clock line. Because if you've got, you know, 20 chips hanging off of one clock line, you're going to have a really hard time driving uh, all those chips reliably at, you know, a couple megahertz that this thing uh, will run at. So the ideal solution would be to have each chip buffer uh, the clock line and the uh, data line so that uh, each chip, you know, drives just the wire from, you know, itself to the next chip, which is a much easier proposition, especially since there's going to be only one load. and. Uh, Presumably, the distance between the chips is not going to be uh, too big. So you might be wondering, well, where's the uh, latch input? Well, these things are auto latching. So if the clock uh, input is low for more than about 500 microseconds, uh, the thing latches automatically. And of course, this is done for similar reasons, so that you don't have to share uh, a latch line across, you know, a huge number of chips and the associated problems with that. And uh, so for a little bit of a uh, quick overview of how this works, you shift in 24 bits. Uh, there's 8 bits for each brightness channel, one for this LED, one for this one, and then one for this one. Um, usually it'd be for red, green, and blue LEDs, but I'm using them for three white LEDs. So anyways, 24 bits goes in here thing waits for a 500 uh, microsecond uh, idle time on the clock and then it pushes those values that it has in its internal shift register out into the constant current drivers so you don't get any flickering as you're putting in uh, new data. Now there's one other thing that separates this from a classic shift register um, is that it actually uh, doesn't start forwarding the clock in to the clock out and the output of the last um, shift register stage to the serial data out until it gets 24 bits, uh, so basically until it fills up. Um, and this is probably done to uh, either lower power consumption or just simplify the on-chip design. Uh, basically, once it gets 24 bits of data, it connects, uh, you know, clock in and serial data in through a buffer to clock out and serial data out, and then it stops uh, modifying its internal memory. So if you put in uh, 48 bits going in, you know, from here, from your microcontroller. This chip on, you know, in the next stage will only get 24 bits of data. So you shift out the first 24, that populates this. Then you shift out the next 24, and that populates this and doesn't touch anything here. And then if you have another stage, you know, you put in 24 extra bits here, it just sends it right through. You know, the one over here will also send it right through, and then, you know, the next one will get exactly 24 bits. So it's a pretty clever system that allows you to build, you know, very cheap uh, LED light strips because you don't have to have all these extra wires and extra driver circuitry. It's all taken care of inside this thing. So I would call it my favorite chip of uh, at least the week. So here is the etched board for the uh, WS2801 breakouts that I made. Uh, the green isn't uh, copper oxide, don't worry, it's just this uh, green TRF stuff that I use. You do toner transfer on here, and then you uh, put this on top so it kind of fills in the gaps left by the toner. So I've interconnected all of this. You can see interconnect lines supplying power and data to all the instances of this board or copies of this board so that I'll be able to hook it up. Um, to test it all out as it will be hooked up in the final application. And, you know, I couldn't let all this extra board space go to waste, so I have some uh, SO uh, breakouts here, some TSSOP breakouts here, Stark Industries logo because, hey, why not? You know, various other things. Last Ninja, oh, upside down. Last Ninja, Deus Ex. Anyways, so uh, I'll be drilling all the holes for all the uh, through-hole parts.
Toys All Day. All right, well, here's the partially assembled uh, set of boards. I've left off a couple of the resistors. Um, those resistors are for impedance matching. I want to have these separated out and connected together with long, uh, long cables. That won't be necessary right now, so I figured I'd just do a quick test. You'll notice I only have the uh, silk screen on one of the instances because, frankly, I couldn't be bothered to put it on all of them. All right, so I've soldered on a wire real quick and uh, hooked up these three LEDs. So the data and clock lines are paralleled up with the data and clock lines for this chip. So we should see these lights mirroring these ones up here. And I've got this meter set up to monitor the current of this one. It should be around 20 milliamps. Let's power this thing up, see what happens. Hey, it works. Cool. So at least that one works. Well, if you're wondering what the waveform will look like, it's just, you know, simple PW on. Anyways, I have a much easier way of testing this thing. I've just got an LED hooked up to this little wire here, so if I touch the output of one of these, there it goes. Let's try the last one here, let's see what it does. Okay, cool. So that means the data is getting through every single last chip, which means that we probably don't have any dead chips in here, which is good. So I'll just test all of these out, all the channels, and then hopefully we can do something a bit more interesting than just blink a bunch of lights. All right, all the boards are separated, somewhat crudely, but uh, they should work. All right, so I've got a couple of these wired up. This one's just using a jumper wire because I don't want to put half a wire here. I want to make a full wire to the next one, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. So I've got this connected. I've got this sort of hacked in. And uh can't help myself. I want to try it out. Hopefully it works. It's way too late now, so I wouldn't be surprised if I made some wiring errors, but let's plug this in and see what happens. Hopefully we'll get a bunch of flashing lights. And we sort of do. Not all of them though. Oh well. I'll figure it out. Well ladies and gentlemen, this is a lesson. Always make sure you have enough bypassing on your circuits. I thought I did. I have a couple of chip capacitors in here. Clearly, it's not enough. See, the blinking is supposed to be smooth like that, but it's not. There's bad data getting down here. So what I'm going to do, just to prove a point, is I'm going to stick this capacitor across the power supply of that one. It won't fix everything, because I can't do this to both of the circuits at once, because um, I don't have enough hands or eyes, but uh, I'll do it here and then you should be able to see a vast improvement in at least that LED. So polarity is correct. There, see? Much better. Not perfect, of course, but I'll get there. Alright, it also doesn't help that I've got, you know, these things carrying a couple megahertz of signal. It's pretty bright looks much cooler in real life as it happens. Those LEDs look white to my eye, but the camera thinks they're blue. Okay, well, that's enough for today. It's pretty late. Not looking forward to wiring up all the rest of these. It's a lot of wires, but oh well. Thanks for watching, and I'll uh, have an update in a couple days.